Hey everyone, welcome to Ayurveda Everyday with Talia. I am so happy to be here with my dear friend and colleague, fellow Ayurvedic practitioner and master nutritionist, Mary Sheila Ganella. Um, we are here to give you a special, what I like to call these vitality sessions, because everything that we talk about in the vitality sessions is about helping you have more energy, vitality, and radiance, especially for the things that matter to you the most. And with Thanksgiving coming up in just a couple of days, um, you know, there's a lot to think about your family, your health, you know, your mood, how you feel over the holiday, all of that. So we've got some really cool information to share with you, plus a practice. Um, so I'm going to kick it off with like taking it over to Mary Sheila, because one of the things we want to talk about tonight is um, cortisol. And um, Mary Sheila is really eloquent in the way she talks about it. So please take it away, Mary Sheila. Hey, Talia. <laughs> thank you for having me. <clears throat> yes. So we are in the midst of the holiday season and it can be stressful. Like, let's face it, it can be stressful. And we want to share with you and kind of arm you with some strategies that you can use to keep calm and keep your cortisol low. And, and, we're gonna and you're going to tell us why keeping yes. cortisol low is so key. And also a lot of you who are watching, um, you know, you may have heard me speak about false kapha, which is something that I've made up, but kind of when you're like, I feel like I'm doing all the right things, but I'm gaining weight or I'm feeling heavy or I can't get rid of this bloating or even depression or anxiety. And um, cortisol is very much linked to many times to this experience of developing kapha when like kind of you shouldn't be. So Sorry, Mary Sheila, but I just want to, I prefaced it this no, morning that's... by talking about it that way. So <laughs> that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Okay. So, <clears throat> so you have these, so if you take your hands and you put them behind your back, like, you know, kind of like this, and that's where your kidneys are. And right sitting on top of your kidneys are two little walnut sized shaped adrenal glands and your adrenal glands excrete <laughs> our fight or flight hormones, specifically cortisol. Cortisol is going to help us to take action. It's going to be, you know, it has a circadian rhythm. It's high in the morning, low in the afternoon, evening. It has a rhythm. And that rhythm helps us to get up and go in the morning and calm down and sleep at night. And it's helping us to deal with stresses during the day and then to regenerate at night when we sleep. So it's got a wonderful role. And but when we're under a great deal of stress, it's going to get heightened. And it's part of our hormonal endocrine system. It's part of a whole team. I call them the team of first responders. And they're all working together. It's everything from our blood sugar balance to our thyroid gland to our adrenals and our ovaries. And for men, their testes. It's all connected. <clears throat> so what you do to one hormone is going to kind of be like the domino effect to the others. So when we're under more stress, right, so the holidays, having to travel and maybe having to see family that we feel a little, you know, or eating too much or drinking too much, any of those things can become a stressor. And even eating the wrong things. Sometimes we might find ourselves eating things that we're like, I'm really not supposed to be eating this because I have an allergy to it. All of those things can cause an adrenal response and cause cortisol to heighten. When cortisol heightens, that is when our body wants to fight or flight. And so it is, it basically is telling our physiology, our biochemistry to get more quick energy in the form of sugar, in the form of glucose. So we actually start to crave more sugar when we're stressed. Ding, ding, and, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Revelation. Exactly. Yes. And that's a, a bummer because those are the times we don't want to be doing that. And we're like, oh my gosh, why did I eat all that sugar? And why am I, you know, just doing all these things I don't normally want to be doing? Right, because your body becomes insulin resistant under stress as well. So you're not even absorbing, uptaking the sugar you're eating. It's staying in your bloodstream, right? Exactly. To some exactly. degree, at least. Exactly. When you hear about most disease, what is the root cause? You hear it as being stress. So imagine 
oh my gosh, I'm really stressed. Like I could get an email that stresses me out. I could have a bad night's sleep, which is a stress to my system. I could be, you know, not get having the right nutrients or too many of the wrong nutrients, right? There's a lot. I could, uh, be, I could be over, ex- yeah, I could be over exercising because I'm trying to release excess kapha, but I'm exactly. pushing my adrenals too hard because what I really need is to rest and restore. Exactly. Yeah. So all of a sudden I have these heightened, all this excess cortisol. Again, every time I have cortisol, my body's all, ooh, you're stressed or you need to fight or flight. Here's, so I have stored glucose. So my stored glucose, it's called glycogen. It comes out. I have a blood sugar rise and insulin comes out and I have a blood sugar fall. Well, my cortisol is still high. I need energy quick. I'm going to then be craving the carbs because it's my innate wisdom that says, you got to run or you got to fight. You need the energy for your muscles. So it's very natural to have that, um, to have that crate, th- those cravings. Right. Right. <clears throat> and, and, you know, cortisol over time. So, so then, that, then I have these things swinging. Maybe I didn't even eat anything that first one. So that starts happening. I'm going to have highs. I'm going to have lows and my cells might become resistant. And so stress can set the body up for diabetes or prediabetes and insulin resistance. And, and then that can cough and false kapha. And then, <laughs> then, you know, in Ayurveda, we talk a lot about things flooding and then that can flood into the cardiovascular system, right? And all of a sudden, then the heart is affected by, you know, the blood that becomes thicker. So it all kind of spirals in that way. So, <clears throat> so the goal is, okay, I'm feeling stressed, like for whatever reason around the holidays, what c- action can I take that's like literally like even closer than my fingertips to calm down my stress response and allow me to like gather myself and and literally calm the cortisol in the body. I know. What? <laughs> you. I pick me, you, Talia. Me, me. We can breathe. Yes. We can breathe. Absolutely. Okay, so Mary Sheila has an amazing story. We're going to tell you, we're going to give you a really cool breathing practice that you can do in the bathroom, outside when you're like taking the dog out, you know, something quick that you can do to lower cortisol if this is resonating for you and you're like, I totally need something to help me manage these cravings. I have trouble sleeping, all the things we're ta- that we're talking about here. But will you tell the story about the woman you met at the Weston Price Conference? Yes. Um, because it has to do with breath, and I just want to emphasize why breath is so, so powerful for us. Yes. So I like to call breath our first food. Okay. First so food. just if you kind of frame it that way, right? So when, when we need a remedy, we can come, we need to start with the basics always. <clears throat> so I was giving a talk at a Weston Price Society meeting in Petaluma. I live in Sonoma County, and I was doing a talk. It's called Food, Mood, and Fermentation. And so it was all about the gut brain access. <clears throat> so I had my little slideshow because that's how I roll. And I had this really beautiful picture of all the prebiotic foods. And prebiotics are, are foods that contain a lot of fibers that we can't necessarily break down, but they are pure, like amazing delicacy foods for our gut microbiome, for all our bacteria. So I had this slide of all these pictures and this young woman in the audience said, oh, I had SIBO. I couldn't eat any of those, but I don't have it anymore. And now I can. And I was like, oh, cool. And I just kind of kept going on with my, with my talk. But just to give you a little background, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's sort of the diagnosis, you know, if you get it diagnosed, that a lot of people when they have IBS, so in the past, IBS was irritable bowel syndrome. It's like, yeah, we know you have diarrhea, constipation, gas, bloating. We don't really know why. So you're under this umbrella of IBS. Well, we now know SIBO and we can actually even test for it or at least, you know, and, and talk about the symptoms more stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that basically means like the, the small intestine is about 20 feet long. So even though it's called small, it's 20 feet long, but it's really skinny. And yes, there's bacteria. <laughs> yes, there's bacteria in the small intestine, but there's the more and different varieties in the large intestine. The large intestine is about five feet long and wider. And so when those bacteria eat all that fiber, 
they off gas, right? They, their, their byproducts are gassy, but there's room for it in the large intestine and there's a, a closer exit route, right? So 20 feet long in the small intestine, it's basically the right bacteria in the wrong place. That's what SIBO is, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth the right bacteria in the wrong place so she had it and so usually when people have SIBO they have lots of gas and bloating and they do have alternating diarrhea and constipation and that's because those bacteria is in the wrong place they sort of halt our motility uh, cells that help with motility and peristalsis and moving things along in the right direction so they'll get stalled and then they'll flush out so it's very uncomfortable anyway she was pretty sick with it and so after my talk I said excuse me, like, what did you do for your SIBO? Because I'm a practitioner. I want to know what works for people because SIBO is a little tricky sometimes. It's very tricky She's, for a lot yeah, of people. Exactly. So I said, what did you do? And she said, well, I was really broke at the time. All I had was Medi-Cal. I also, like, could not take – so I didn't have money for all the supplements. But I honestly couldn't even imagine taking them. My gut was such a wreck. And so was my, um, and I didn't want to take antibiotics. I was, you know, that's what she told me. And I said, well, then what'd you do? And she said, well, I started researching it and I started learning about the breath and the power of the breath to heal this. And I was like, oh, she said, I studied breath and I just worked and focused on my breathing like when I wasn't eating and when I was eating. And she said, I figure those little guys are anaerobic. So I was going to send a lot of oxygen down there and get things moving along. And it was such a light bulb for me as a practitioner. And I was really excited. I started sharing it with all my clients that could benefit. And I worked at a, I was working at a clinic, which I still work at. And I told the doctors, you know, I was like, everybody listen to this. And one of the doctors said, Oh, I just read a study on how, you know, deep abdominal breathing is even more effective than any kind of antacid. So I started telling any client that I, that was telling me their symptoms. I said, let me tell you this story. And I, you know, the first person that I told, she said, Oh my gosh, you know, again, I could see the light bulb. And she said, I have been struggling with this for three years but there was about nine months where I was doing yoga regularly and we, my yoga teacher really focused on the breath. And you know what? I didn't have any symptoms during that whole nine months. So it was her realizing like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I need to do. And, and again, it's free. It's your breath. It's something you do every day. It's your first food. So you know, how can you, you know, you can use it for digestion. So if that's you, if you can, can relate to any of those symptoms, then breath is a great area of focus. And then if you're feeling your cortisol rise, like in the holidays, like at your uncle's, you know, dinner party, and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, maybe they start talking about politics, who knows? How can you, like, what's your strategy for calming your stress, right? Yeah, and, and another way you can notice the stress is if you have the urge to start stress eating. Meaning, yeah. like, you've already had enough, and five minutes ago you felt fine, but then Aunt Martha says something to you that triggers you, and now you want to go have more pumpkin pie and chocolate cake or whatever. That would also be an indicator of your cortisol levels have raised because any trigger is going to, can put you into fight or flight. We know that from studying the brain, amygdala, hippocampus response to trauma and triggers. Okay, so we're, we just want to share with you this amazing knowledge. I hope you think it's awesome. We think it's so awesome. Um, it's so powerful. So what, what we want to share with you is, you know, just a really simple breath practice that you can go and do, like I said before, in the bathroom, step outside, take a walk around the block. Even when you're sitting at the table, at the Thanksgiving table, you know, no one's going to notice if you take a few deep breaths before you start eating the, your food or if you put your fork down between bites and take a few, you know, count like three or three to five deep breaths just to help you continuously be centered in yourself throughout your holiday experience. Um, but the, the breath I'm going to teach you um, is just so simple. It's basically putting your left hand on your heart and your right hand on your lower abdomen. 
And the reason why you put your hands on your body is so that you can feel the expansion of the breath. So when you breathe in, you start by expanding your belly, your lower belly, like that doctor said, deep, full belly breaths. Um, so you fill up the lower abdominal um, cavity, you let it come up to your solar plexus, mid belly, and all the way up to your heart. So you actually feel your left hand, you know, kind of moving away from your body a little bit. And then on the exhale, you bring it back in. And when you do this breath, the key for lowering cortisol is to have your exhale be longer than your inhale. Um, and, and what I've noticed being a vata predominant person, and when we're talking about stress, a lot of times that's what we will all relate to as like, ah, my vata is like totally crazy or out of balance, is when you count your breath, the length of your breath, the counting itself helps bring you present into the moment you're in. And that is very grounding. And this whole idea of exhaling is 100% vata reducing. So you, we, we breathe in and we want to bring in all of that oxygen because it's such a rich anti-inflammatory healing you know, element. But then we want to make sure the exhale is really long and slow and deep so that we are promoting downward motion, cortisol release, vata redu reduction as we breathe. So it can really be as simple as, you know, counting to five as you inhale, the top of the breath is number five, and then as you exhale, you count to seven, and you try to slow down the breath with your throat in your nose, like kind of in the back of your throat, almost like a Darth Vader breath. Mm -hmm. um, slowing it down so that it goes down and out through the chest, the middle of your abdomen, your lower belly, and out through the um, your root chakra, the base of your spine. So that can do wonders for you, and we want you to take that, take this little tool, put it in your pocket, take it with you to the holidays, whether it's Thanksgiving, who knows what else you've got going on. <laughs> you know, holiday season is a lot of things for a lot of people. So take it with you, use it to lower cortisol. And if this kind of information and, you know, you are just like, I'm like a sponge just soaking up what Talia and Mary Sheila are saying, then I invite you to stay tuned this week because Mary Sheila and I are um, offering a super special Black Friday um, surprise and we're going to be emailing about it. Um, we'll probably make announcements on social media too and Facebook um, just to honor that we're here now. But um, stay tuned because we are co-leading a retreat in Mexico this spring and our Black Friday offer has something to do with that. So get excited and um, yeah, check it out. If you're not on Mary Sheila's mailing list, she has an incredible free offering called The Breakfast Report which is actually um, all about how with your food and your food choices in the morning when cortisol is naturally high, how you can balance your hormones with the way that you eat in the morning. It's phenomenal. Someday, someday soon to be a book, I think. Um, and then if you're not on my mailing list, you can go to taliaskitchen.com and grab my Ayurveda Starters Guide. I will put links to all this in the video so you don't have to search for it. But thank you so much for watching. As always, thank you for being part of Ayurveda Every Day with Talia and Mary Sheila. We love you and adore you. And we hope all of you have a wonderful holiday. Yes, Bye. thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>